All right, good afternoon, everyone. A few things here at the top. I'll get right to your questions. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to echo some of the points made earlier today by Secretary Austin during his remarks at Senate testimony. Uh, as the Secretary said, the Department has submitted an urgent supplemental budget request to help fund America's national security needs to stand by our partners and invest in our defense industrial base. We're requesting $10.6 billion to help Israel defend itself, $44.4 billion to help Ukraine continue to defend itself against Russia's ongoing aggression, and $3.3 billion to meet U.S. military requirements and our submarine industrial base and to fulfill our AUKUS commitments. During his testimony, the Secretary thanked the Senators for their bipartisan support to ensure that we can defend America and stand by the allies and partners who magnify our strength. Now, when it comes to the situation in the Middle East, Secretary Austin highlighted that first and foremost, we will continue to protect American forces and our citizens in the region. Second, we will continue to flow critical security assistance to Israel. Our focus is on providing air defense capabilities, precision guided munitions, and more interceptors for the Iron Dome system. Third, we're coordinating closely with the Israelis to help secure the release of the hostages held by Hamas, including American citizens. Secretary Austin highlighted that we immediately provided U.S. military advisors to offer best practices for integrating hostage recovery into Israel's operations. And finally, we've strengthened our force posture across the region to deter any state or non-state actors from escalating this crisis beyond Gaza to include the presence of two carrier strike groups currently in the region. Moving to other updates, today I can announce the decision to deploy an additional 300 troops to the U.S. Central Command region from home stations in the continental United States. These additional troops will provide capabilities in explosive ordnance disposal, communications, and other support enablers for forces already in the region. Please note that we will not discuss specific deployment locations for these forces, but I can confirm they are not going to Israel and that they are intended to support regional deterrence efforts and further bolster U.S. force protection capabilities. Separately, Secretary Austin continues to remain in close contact with his Israeli counterpart. He spoke with Israeli Minister of Defense Yoav Gallant yesterday by phone and received updates on Israel's phased operations in Gaza. The Secretary commended the Israel Defense Force's commitment to hostage recovery and re-emphasized the importance of conducting operations in accordance with the law of war. He also stressed the imperative to protect innocent civilians and allow unfettered humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, we have posted a readout of the call on the DOD website. Shifting gears later this afternoon, Secretary Austin will welcome his Australian counterpart, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Defense Richard Marles, to the Pentagon to discuss the United States-Australia Alliance and review progress on defense initiatives following the 2023 Australia-U.S. Ministerial Consultations earlier this summer. We will share a readout following the meeting. Also this afternoon, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, the Director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO, will be discussing the status of the ARO website and the next phase of the secure mechanism for contacting ARO to report on Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, or UAP. Additional details can be found in the press advisory published earlier today, and I would encourage any media interested in asking questions on this topic to take part in Dr. Kirkpatrick's briefing. And separately tomorrow, a pre-scheduled operational test launch of a U.S. Air Force Global Strike Command on and reliability of our strategic deterrence system System while sending a visible message of assurance to allies. For any further questions, I'd refer you to Air Force Global Strike Command. And finally, I'd like to take a moment to send General Eric Smith, Commandant of the Marine Corps, well wishes and a speedy recovery on behalf of Secretary Austin and the entire Department of Defense. Our thoughts and prayers are with him and his family. And with that, I'll be happy to take your questions. We'll go to Tarakop, Associated Press. Hi, General Robert. Um, in the days since the Lewiston shooting, it's come to light that the Army determined that the main reservist shouldn't have had a gun at the time, and there's been numerous other warning signs about him. Is the Pentagon looking at all at maybe something that was missed or a way to maybe t further tighten reporting to law enforcement in the wake of this attack? Yeah, thanks, Tara. So I'm not aware of any specific uh, departmental efforts as it relates to this individual case. What I would say is that for service members who uh, are departing the service, 
uh, or service members who are even still in the service, uh, but in particular those departing, uh, we do offer a wide variety of services uh, as part of that transition process to include medical and mental health care services. Uh, once a service member leaves, uh, he or she is, of course, a private citizen, uh, and when appropriate, certainly the DOD would, would consult with local law enforcement. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the, the individual, of course, is in the Army Reserve, so I'd refer you to, to them for any further questions. All right. Um, and further, can you give us an update? Has there been any additional tax on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria in the last 24 hours? Is the total still uh, 23, I think? Um, so, you know, again, we'll continue to keep you updated. What I'm tracking right now is since our self-defense uh, self strikes on 26 October, there have been six additional uh, what I would consider small-scale attacks, uh, three in Iraq, three in Syria. Um, right now we're tracking a total of 27 attacks, um, 16 in Iraq, 11 in Syria. Again, as we see the, the data miner alerts pop up, uh, we check each of those with CENTCOM, go back uh, to verify the information, and, and as that information is either verified or, or batted down, we'll be, make sure to let you know. Did any of those actually hit the bases, or were they all intercepted? Um, in some cases, uh, they just didn't okay. strike anything. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, to my knowledge, no injuries, no damaged infrastructure. Okay. Thanks very much. Yes, sir. Uh, General, you have uh, discussed about these attacks, the need to keep the response specifically to them isolated to the anti-ISIS coalition and how that's separate from what's going on in Gaza. But we have seen such an increase over the past couple of weeks. Um, does the department acknowledge at least a, a link of what's spurring these attacks is the U.S.'s support for Israel? Yeah, so I think it's important to differentiate between uh, what Iranian proxies in Iran might be saying and the perspective that we bring to this, which is our forces are in Iraq and Syria for one purpose, which is the enduring defeat of ISIS. That's why they're there. That's what they'll stay focused on. So uh, this is separate and distinct from the situation in Israel, between Israel and Hamas. And so, again, our message is we will take whatever necessary actions to protect those forces, to deter future attacks, uh, and if and when we need to respond, we would do so at a time and place of our choosing. If they are separate, what has led to the increase in attacks over the past couple of weeks? Well, certainly this is not the first time we've seen these Iranian proxy groups do these kinds of things for a multitude of purported various reasons. So that in and of itself is not unusual. Uh, and again, we'll do what we need to do to protect our troops. And you said you're, you're going to hold them um, accountable. Do you have a sense of how involved uh, the Iranian government is on these attacks, or are they simply just not communicating for these groups to hold off, or do they even have that, that power? Yeah, we, we know that these groups are funded, trained, sponsored by the Iranian government, and we hold the Iranian government responsible for that. Let me go to the phone here. Uh, Tony from Bloomberg. Ed, sorry, uh, I, quick, I, I have a slow to unmute. Two quick questions. Roughly, how much presidential drawdown authority do you have left now for Ukraine? And I had a second question about the Persian Gulf. Yeah, sure. Uh, so right now we have uh, a little more than $5.4 billion uh, in restored PDA authority that remains available for Ukraine. And in Persian Gulf, is the United States increasing its force posture or protection measures in the Gulf to protect international shipping from Iranian small boat harassment attacks, if in fact that occur, they occur. Well, Tony, you know we we have those forces in the region uh, for a variety of, of things to include uh, helping to protect uh, the, the shipping lanes and, and uh, free flow of commerce through the region, and, and we've been doing that for a very long time. So certainly that is a capability that we can provide working alongside our partners in the region. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Thank you. John. Thanks, General Ryder. Uh, you mentioned that the U.S. is providing munitions uh, to Israel. Does that include bordering munitions like the switchblades or Phoenix Ghost mm -hmm. that the U.S. is providing to Ukraine? Yeah, so beyond what I've already provided, I don't have any additional uh, support to announce. Again, you know, we're focused on artillery, ammunition, precision-guided munitions, and air defense 
capabilities. And with regard to air and missile defense in the Middle East, um, is the U.S. providing any directed energy air and missile defense systems to uh, U.S. troop locations in the Middle East that have come under attack to kind of augment their traditional air defense capabilities? Um, so I don't want to go into the specific capabilities that we're using to uh, protect our forces other than to say we have a wide variety, which does include uh, directed energy capabilities. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, General. I have two questions. On the cruelty of U.S. extended deterrence to South Korea, what is the Pentagon's assessment of the U.S. and South Korea joint report, uh, joint research report on the strengthening nuclear guarantees for South Korea, which aims to redeploy U.S. nuclear weapons in a uh, this uh, an impeasable way if North Korea refuses to freeze nuclear weapons production. I'm sorry, Janie. I, can you repeat that last part? I didn't fully understand. I want to make sure I get your question right. I mean, which aims to redeploy U.S. nuclear weapons in a feasible way if North Korea refuses to uh, nuclear uh, gotcha. product weapons. Yeah, so I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals. Um, we've been very clear in terms of our commitment to extended deterrence, working very closely with our Republic of Korea allies, our Japanese allies, and others in the region to, to deter. Uh, and we continue to stay very focused on that. We'll continue to consult closely to make sure that we have the forces in theater to be able to prevent any type of, um, you know, issue like, like you highlight, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. The defense ministers of China and Russia praised the military cooperation between the two countries at a recent conference in Beijing, and they blamed the United States for the Middle East crisis, uh, saying that uh, it was due to U.S.'s faulty diplomacy. Why do China and Russia say that the war between Israel and Hamas is because of the United States? Uh, I'll let uh, China and Russia speak for themselves. I think their, their record speaks for itself. Body. Thank you, General. So on the U.S. assistance to, to Israel, can you update us on how many shipments you have delivered and the price tag uh, of these shipments so far? I cannot. I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, as, as you know, we continue to provide uh, assistance to Israel pretty much on a daily basis, uh, and we'll continue to stay focused on communicating them as far as what their needs are. In the future, if we have that information uh, and we're able to provide it, we certainly will, but as of right now, I don't have that. Is, is there, I mean, is it a, a, an issue of collecting how much you sent, or is it something else? Because in the case of Ukraine, um, there's whenever there's a, a new package of assistance, the Pentagon announces what's in it and the price tag. So this is is being offered in the name of American taxpayers and American people. Yeah, no, what, very, what yeah. Been able to know what's been offered. So uh, again, I don't have that information in front of me. Uh, as appropriate, we'll provide it. Certainly, right now, there's an element of operation security. Um, and the, the mechanisms by which we're providing assistance to Israel from a policy uh, and a legal standpoint are a little bit different, and from a budgetary standpoint are a little bit different than the way we're providing aid to Ukraine. Uh, and so, you know, again, we will make sure that we're as transparent as possible while also recognizing that there are operation security aspects to this. Uh, but like I said, if at an appropriate point in time we have that information to provide and we're able to, we will. So, um, so you'll, you'll try to offer the information when if, if yeah, but I mean, we've been very clear in terms of the kinds of capabilities we're providing, in terms of the, the types of munitions, uh, medical support, uh, air defense support, and those kinds of things. And if I may, uh, the IDF spokesperson on CNN with Wolf Blitzer uh, minutes ago acknowledged that Israel targeted Jabalia refugee camp, um, where scores of civilians have been killed. The IDF spokesperson said, this is the tragedy of war. We've been saying for days, move south. Uh, your own department is saying there are no restrictions on Israel how to use uh, weapons provided by the U.S. The secretary today, in his tweet about his phone call with Mr. Gallant, said he reemphasized the safety of civilians. Wouldn't the idea of putting some restrictions on, on how Israel used the weapon 
actually achieve the target of uh, making sure civilians aren't being killed the way we're seeing? I mean, the UNRWA is saying, and this is a quote, Gaza has become a graveyard for thousands of children. Yeah, thanks, Fadi. So I, I can't speak to individual uh, Israeli strikes. Um, I've seen the, the press reports on that. I, I don't have any information on that. Um, you heard Secretary Austin say today that taking civilian safety into account is both a moral and a strategic obligation. Uh, and we do care about civilian casualties, and we've made it both clear publicly and privately about our concern for the protection of innocent light and, and life and the respect uh, for the law of war, and that's not going to change. Um, but I also think it's important to not forget about the common denominator here, which is Hamas, which is a terrorist organization that has taken a page out of the ISIS playbook in terms of brutality and wanton disregard for civility and for human rights. And not only did they commit a horrific, horrific slaughter of Israeli civilians and take more than 200 hostages to use as bargaining chips, but they've willfully and deliberately integrated their operations, their command and control nodes, armories, rockets targeting Israel among the innocent Gazan population, thus in effect employing them as human shields. And so it's Hamas using Palestinians as human shields that is creating this extra challenge for Israel as they conduct their operations. And we're going to, of course, continue to talk to our Israeli partners about the importance of taking civilian safety into account as they conduct their operations, but we also recognize that they have a responsibility and a duty to their citizens to protect their citizens from future Hamas attacks, and we're going to continue to support them that in that effort. Uh, and as you heard Secretary Austin and Secretary Blinken talk about today, the U.S. government is also going to continue to work very closely with other partners as well as vetted NGOs to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza to the Palestinians, because again, no one wants to see innocent people suffering, whether they be Palestinian or Israeli. Thank you. Yes, Joe. Thank you, General. I want to go back to the Houthis attack against Israel. Do you have any additional information in regards to this attack? You could share it with us. Was it a missile or a UAV? And also, does the Pentagon consider the Houthis activities right now as a threat to Israel or it could, ex it could be extended to the whole region. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what I know. Um, right now, we are aware that uh, the Houthis did fire a, uh, a medium-range um, ballistic missile um, uh, or yeah, cruise missile to uh, targeting Israel. Israel did take it down. The IDF did take it down. Uh, and so I certainly re refer you to the IDF to talk about that uh, in particular. Uh, this is something that we will continue to monitor, as we've said before. Uh, we want to prevent a broader regional conflict. We will continue to stay in close contact with our partners in the region uh, to make sure that we continue to do that. But that, that's all I've got on that at this point. Thank you very much. There's a big difference between a ballistic missile and a cruise missile. Which, which did you say? Um, this was a uh, – I'll have to come back to you, David. I don't want to get it wrong. Yep. But oh. we, know that, we know that they have missile, as I've mentioned before, uh, they have um, missiles that can range approximately 2,000 kilometers, so clearly uh, within range of Israel. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. So today, Secretary Austin said that if uh, if U.S. stops supporting Ukraine, Russia will succeed in Ukraine. Do you have additional options for supporting Ukraine's military in case if Congress does not approve new funding now or in the future? Yeah, so at this, at this point, I appreciate the question. I, I don't want to get into the hypotheticals. Uh, we will continue to work closely with Congress to get the funding that we need. Uh, we're confident that we can continue to support both Ukraine and Israel. One more in Ukraine. Could you provide us the updates on the training in Arizona on, on F-16s and how long approximately can it take for the pilots to complete the course? Sure. Um, let me just double check here. Uh, so right now, um, what we uh, expect graduation completion will be dependent on the individual proficiency of pilots themselves, um, but we can estimate about five to nine months for them to complete that, that training. Five to nine? Five, five to, to nine. nine. Yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir. Thank you very much, General. Um, the United States has been uh, providing military guidance and assistance and also lethal assistance to Israel, and you've made it very clear that you're talking to your counterparts about they have to be uh, mindful of 
loss of civilian life. Uh, but also there are statements coming from both Secretary Austin and also the White House that there's no conditions set on the use of the munition and the U.S. is not drawing any red lines, quote unquote. Um, would you say that it's basically a blank check to the Israeli military to do whatever they want because there is support from the United States and there's no conditions set? And would you say that it's time to perhaps start warning, about, warning them about consequences rather than, you know, recommendations? Well, I think Secretary Austin did talk about his consultation uh, with his Israeli counterpart and, and again across the board about the importance of taking civilian safety into account in order to think through the second and third order effects here, right? And so again, we're providing these munitions to Israel to support their efforts to protect their civilians from further terrorist attacks. Uh, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces are a professional military. They're engaged in a campaign to defeat ISIS and prevent them from doing what they did on October 7th. And, and as we've said, we support their right to defend themselves against terrorism, but in a way that upholds the laws of war and protects uh, civilians. And so, uh, again, as I highlighted earlier, uh, the challenge in all of this is the fact that you see Hamas embedding themselves among the uh, Gazan population. And so, again, we're going to continue to relay to our Israeli partners that they must distinguish between terrorists and innocent civilians as they root out Hamas, uh, and they've acknowledged that. Thank you. One more mm -hmm. quick question. It sounds like a valid point that Hamas is using these civilians as human shields. That's why there are these casualties, but we're talking about thousands of civilians. So are you able to pick out the ones that the Israelis are saying, okay, I mean, they're right, you know, like they've been used as human shields. And if these are strikes specifically, no, they actually haven't upheld the laws of war. Is the DOD able to make that differentiation? Well, look, I, I'll let uh, the Israelis speak to their own specific operations. We know that they're not uh, deliberately targeting civilians, unlike Hamas, which did deliberately target civilians and is deliberately using uh, civilians as human shields. Um, and so, again, this is what creates a very challenging operational environment. And again, for our part, we will continue to communicate the importance of taking the laws of war into account, as well as protecting civilians. Uh, let me let me go to the phone here. Uh, Jared from El Monitor. Hey, sir, just wondering if you can confirm uh, the uh, 26 Marine Expeditionary Unit and the Amphibious Ready Group, are they in the Eastern Med yet? Uh, so, Jared, what I can tell you right now is they're still in the U.S. Central Command AOR, uh, Air of Responsibility. Um, beyond that, I, I don't have any updates to provide. If, if and when there are, we'll certainly let you guys know um, when we can. Thank you. Let me go to Laura Seligman, Seligman Politico. Hey, Pat, thanks for this. Um, two questions. Um, first of all, has Secretary Austin spoken with uh, the new House Speaker yet? Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things I imagine he'd be wanting to talk about, including aid for Ukraine, and then I have a follow-up. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Uh, I will have to get back to you on that. Uh, certainly the, the Secretary's on the Hill today. Uh, I do not know if he had the chance while he was there to engage with the, the House Speaker, so we'll come back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. And then a different question. There was just um, a story from the New York Times saying that Chris Mayer said that there were there were U.S. Special Operations Forces currently in Israel trying to help locate the hostages. I'm just wondering um, if that is accurate, um, or is that, uh, or are the Special Operations Forces the ones that were some, that were just offering advice to the Israelis and are now gone? Right. My understanding uh, is that these uh, forces are there uh, supporting the uh, advice and intelligence support as it relates to hostage recovery. Thank you. Ro. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one quick question on North Korea. North Korea said that they will conduct a military satellite launch by the end of October, but they didn't. So does the Pentagon assess their technical issues that North Korea has to resolve for successful satellite launch? Or do you see uh, indications that North Korea is still preparing to conduct uh, satellite launch in the near future? Yeah, thanks, Ria. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I'm not going to go into intelligence on, on what we may or may not know as it relates to that. Certainly something we will continue to monitor. Thank you very much. Time for a few more. Wafa, and then we'll come here. Yes, sir. Uh, yesterday, a senior defense official said that uh, the administration is asking tough questions 
of course, asking Israel uh, tough questions. If you can elaborate on this, uh, especially that it doesn't seem like Israel is taking these advices, and uh, I have another question. Sure. Uh, as I highlighted, I mean, we, we are asking uh, in our consultations, um, you know, like good friends do, and highlighting the importance of being methodical in terms of, uh, you know, targeting, um, taking into account civilian safety, uh, thinking through second and third order effects, as I've highlighted. Again, at the end of the day, uh, these are Israel's operations uh, that they are taking to defend themselves against a future terrorist attack like the one they experienced. Uh, and they're the ones that are going to make decisions. We're not directing, advising them on, on any of that. Um, but again, uh, we'll continue to have those conversations going forward. Yes, ma'am. Um, so Hamas is not a, a conventional army, as you know. And in fact, it's part of uh, the population in Gaza. And it's unlike ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda is considered, uh, Hamas is considered as a resistant movement by a majority in the Arab world. My question is, from a uh, military point of view, how is it possible to destroy or eliminate Hamas without eliminating uh, an entire population in Gaza? Yeah, so we, we don't see uh, the Palestinians as Hamas and Hamas as the Palestinians. And again, I'd go back to October 7th when a uh, terrorist organization essentially killed in cold blood 1,400 people and took 200 hostages, again, using those hostages today as a bargaining chip, preventing people from leaving Gaza. So if you're so-called governing these people but preventing them from leaving Gaza, you know, again, so it is a terrorist group like ISIS, and it is the kinds of thing you saw in places like Raqqa and Mosul where there was a population that was being held by an ideological captor uh, and so, again, we are very focused on making sure that not only does Israel have what it needs to defend itself, but also making sure that Palestinians, Ill innocent Palestinians, can get the aid that they need and looking forward. And again, from this podium, Department of Defense, I'm not going to get into the diplomatic or political realm, but we are interested in what does this look like afterwards and how do we get to a two-state solution so that Palestinians and Israelis can live safely and securely without the threat of being subjugated by a group like Hamas. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Two questions. One, um, as far as Hamas attack, a surprise attack against Israel on October 7, they didn't care who they were killing, civilians or non-civilians. Now Israel have a challenge, as you said, that how to separate civilians from these terrorists. Another thing is that where is the Palestinian government in this war, as far as Israel's war against terrorists on their land? And whenever there is an attack by terrorists, whether it's against the US or India or Israel, those nations, except the East or the West, we call them terrorists, but they call them, they are freedom fighters. Yes. So, as it relates to the, the Palestinian Authority, I'd, I'd refer you to them to talk about where they stand uh, on this issue. Um, and in terms of, you know, the, the definition between freedom fighter and terrorist group, I get what you're saying. Uh, but any moral high ground was lost on October 7th uh, when 1,400 innocent civilians, many of them innocent civilians, killed, hostages taken. Uh, and so, again, uh, that's not the conduct of a professional military that's looking to defend uh, a population. And let me let me go ahead and move on to the phone here. Uh, Patty, task and purpose. Um, I guess it's kind of a bigger question. Um, how is the Pentagon seeing the operations in the Middle East? I mean, are we? What's the operational threshold for us? You know, being considered at war, we're seeing you know movement of troops, movement of military assets, and threats on U.S. troops. So I guess where, how does the Pentagon see all this? Yeah, thanks, Patty. So, so again, I think if we take a step back here, uh, right now we see this uh, conflict in Israel contained to Israel between Israel and Hamas. Um, we do recognize there are broader tensions in the region as a result of that. Uh, which is why we have deployed additional capabilities into the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and into the U.S. Central Command Area of Responsibility to provide us with uh, the options necessary to respond to a wide variety of contingencies. So those forces are really there for two things. One, to deter 
uh, any escalation of a broader regional conflict, which no one wants to security work like the defeat ISIS mission like keeping the lanes of shipping open and with regional partners to to uh, on air defense and things like that so again right now uh, we are working very hard to prevent this from becoming a broader regional conflict We're working very hard to make sure that our forces can continue to stay focused on their mission while at the same time supporting Israel and their fight to defend themselves from terrorism all right got time for just a couple more Mike yes, sir thanks Pat um, you said that uh, I, the IDF is a professional military. You know they're not deliberately targeting civilians. Yet it seems like every time somebody from the Pentagon calls Israel, they have to sort of stress not to target civilians and not to, or they feel the need to, to remind them to uh, act in accordance with the law of war. Has Israel done anything that would lead this building to assume that it's an alien concept to them? I mean, they've been around. As a, as a standing army for 70-something years. And also, I, I, don't, I don't recall this emphasis on any of this military support for Ukraine, that he had, that, is he, did he have to uh, constantly remind his uh, Ukrainian counterpart to uh, follow the rule of law of war in Ukraine? Yeah. Is he, or is it just Israel? Thanks, Mike. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to compare and contrast the conflicts in Ukraine and Israel. I think, you know, we, we've all watched how those have played out. I think uh, at, at the risk of coming across as, um, and I don't mean this to come across like I don't understand what you're asking. Um, clearly, everyone's watching the television and seeing the situation as it plays out in terms of humanitarian uh, situation in Gaza. We recognize that. So you and other members of the press can ask very legitimate questions in terms of what is the Department of Defense saying and doing as it relates to that situation. So that is why we're highlighting the fact that these conversations are taking place because it is a topic on people's minds. And it's a legitimate topic. And again, as I mentioned, um, we recognize the complexity of this conflict. Uh, we recognize the emotion surrounding this conflict. But we also think it's important to have a broader understanding of why we're supporting Israel, why it's important to support Israel, but at the same time, why it's important to also help with the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Uh, and to, to sort of see through the, the smoke screen here that Hamas is attempting to, to put up when it comes to the situation. So um, that's what I would have to offer you on that. All right, let me go to the last question. We'll do John, and then actually we'll go to, to Jim here. Yep. Thanks. I just want to get a quick clarification on something. You said that uh, U.S. air and missile defenses uh, in the Middle East include directed energy weapons. Were those systems that had uh, already been deployed there? I said we have a wide variety in our inventory of the U.S. military that includes directed energy weapons. I didn't say specifically what we've got employed and where. Okay. Okay. So you won't say whether they're in the Middle East? Yeah, at, at this time, I'm just not going to go into what we're using and how we're using it. I mean, you know, you and I have both been over there quite a few times. You've seen we've got a variety of capabilities, uh, you know, to include CWIS and things like that. So I, I'm just not going to go through a, a breakdown, especially while we have forces that are, you know, over there right now. So last question, Jim. General, I'd just like to go over to Ukraine a little bit. It's, it's winter in Ukraine now. Are operations slowing down? What are, what are the Ukrainians telling you? And the training that the United States and the coalition put together for, um, uh, for the Ukrainian uh, units in Germany and in other places, is that contingent on the supplemental being passed also? I'm just curious. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, so again, I, you know, when it comes to providing an operational update, I'd, I'd refer you to the Ukrainians. I would say, largely speaking, uh, what we see are the Ukrainians making some incremental gains. They are making forward progress. Uh, we are seeing in some places uh, the, the Russians attempting offensive operations uh, with limited effect. Uh, I think uh, NSC provided a briefing the other day that talked about uh, some of the, the issues there. Um, all that to say, though, you do see the Russians attempting to, to move forward in some areas. Uh, and so, again, right now we continue to stay focused on making sure that Ukraine has what it needs uh, in order to uh, capitalize on the situation 
uh, have the battlefield effects that are necessary to not only preserve territory but take back sovereign territory. Um, as it as it uh, in regards to training, um, we are continuing to conduct training at Grafenvir. Uh, I will have to get back to you though in terms of the specifics on um, how far out that training will go. Um, but certainly the the supplemental funding will uh, support those efforts for the long term. I think the last thing I'd say on this, and it's an important point, is we're not only focused on the near term, we are focused on the long term uh, defense cooperation and relationship with Ukraine and ensuring that they have what they need to be able to deter future attacks from Russia uh, and maintain their, their sovereignty long term. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it.